What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long. And today I have the pleasure of having Sonny Harris, Dr. Sonny Harris, on the podcast. So Dr. Sonny Harris is a mathematician, trader, and money mentor. And uh, I found out about Sonny first time uh, when she had uh, her podcast on Chat with Traders. So Chat with Traders, that was an excellent podcast. And we're going to talk about it later. But I, I, when I reached out to Sonny and we got in contact, I was like, you know, I listened to your podcast when I was climbing the Tokyo Tower. Uh, it's like the Eiffel Tower of Tokyo. And, I, I, you know, I like to listen to podcasts as I'm doing exercise and stuff. And I was like, wow, it was such a cool podcast. He talks about it. Uh, you know, so like I recommend that podcast a lot. Also, on um, on, on my previous podcast where I, co I had a co-host, Audrey, Audrey Mikulako, she interviewed Sonny as well on Macro Jabber. It was an excellent hmm. podcast that like, a, a t you know, so Sonny is is talking to a younger uh, female trader potential female trader and it's a lot of good uh conversation there so uh now uh I, I have i've been one question yes uh if you're climbing and listening to a podcast you're not going to hear rocks falling yeah but it's it's um it's metal it's like the eiffel tower oh it's like it's like a iron iron uh clad kind of structure so All right. yeah there was no it was it was kind of like a urban hiking kind of exercise you know what i mean so that's what I was doing. But okay, um really cool. go ahead. But yeah, with all that being said, uh yeah, I'm excited to bring uh Sonny Harris on on the podcast. So how you doing, Sonny? I'm doing really well, thank you. Except for the fact that the markets are closed today. Yeah, when we scheduled the podcast, I was like, you know, I don't want it to interfere with the market hours. So let me schedule it like uh towards the end of the day or after hours. And I, on Friday, right? Today, good Friday, and I didn't realize when we scheduled it, the market was going to be closed. I guess you didn't realize it either. <laughs> so. Yeah, Fridays are not typically my favorite day because Friday afternoon, the market closes until Sunday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. So I love watching the markets. So you're still actively in the markets every day, every day. And, and uh, so you, you, so you love them. You love trading. You love all this stuff. And um so has, has it always been like that? When did you get started? You want to uh, take us back to how you began your career and, and everything? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a funny little story first. When I was working in my master's degree, the uh, professor I was working with said, let's do Fibonacci numbers. Now, remember, I am just turned 20 years old. And he said, let's do Fibonacci numbers. That'd be great. There's a lot of math still to be discovered about them. I said, I'm really not interested in doing Fibonacci numbers. And he says, but... You can use them in the stock market. And I said, I will never be interested in the stock market. <laughs> That's what I knew back then. And so I spend my life doing the stock market and the futures markets and the crypto markets now. I, I love it. I got started because I had a little with three other guys and myself. We formed a little company called ISCO, which became the world's uh, leading graphics software graphics program before there was any graphics we were like the first on the scene with graphics everything was a dot matrix printer before that and, awesome <laughs> yeah and so i did that and then uh got it up to 105 people and i decided that i'd never be able to spend that much money i might as well retire so i retired and i gave a lot of my money to brokers and you know the thing i thought was smart to do because i didn't know anything about the stock market so uh, they lost, in three weeks, they lost $75,000. And I said, well, I can do that poorly on my own. So I took the money back and started learning out of necessity. Wow. So so before that, okay, so you mentioned the Fibonacci's when you were 20 years old and uh, your professor, I, I'm a, I think math. So Fibonacci's, from what I understand, I, uh, is like a... It's like found uh, like uh, patterns and numbers found in nature. And I know it applies to like, um, for example, I, I did my master's in architecture. So I, I've been in, in the trading uh, after I did my master's with architecture. But uh, with architecture, we went to I did one study abroad trip. I remember to Vicenza, Italy, uh, you know, to study Andrea Palladio's uh, architecture buildings. And he based all his facades yeah. on the golden. Right. Uh, ratio yeah yeah and that's based off like fibonacci and this was all the renaissance time you had palladio you had fibonacci you had you know uh, leonardo da vinci all, all all the renaissance so yeah. i just find it so interesting so so i never looked into really the fibonacci exactly but it, what do you what is your take on everything on that 
found in nature kind of thing because it, it's it's just at the, it's like it's like mathematics but at the same time it's it's kind of like a creative kind of like you know you you it's it's not really exact you know so what's your what's your take on that because you're you know you're this is your area it's math and art combined so the thing the golden ratio is a three four five right triangle uh three four five <laughs> And uh, that's where you derive those numbers from, is that right triangle for the golden ratio. Fibonacci starts with the sequence 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. And you add each two consecutive numbers to form the third one. So 2 and 3 is 5, 3 and 5 is 8. And that's how you derive that sequence. But the stuff we use in the stock market is the ratios of those numbers to each other. And that's where you come up with the Fibonacci ratios of Point two or twenty three point six percent, thirty eight percent, fifty percent. You know, so that's how you come up with the things that we use on the stock market, and I do use them. Even so what, I said I wouldn't. <laughs> wow. So so what, when um when so you decided it, it clicked for you when you like started to apply that towards like making money in in the stock market. Mm hmm. Yeah. And and my only interest at that time in life had been in math and photography i also have a degree in photography so um i that was my interest and that's that's what led to graphic software the math and the photography so the art side of me and it's that art side that you have to bring into the markets to see patterns but you put the Fibonacci lines on the chart and you can just see it clear as day and uh, so wh what did you start trading uh, first? Because you've traded all types of things, right? I so, have. Have. yeah. Uh, the first thing I started trading was municipal bonds. I would buy and sell high interest rate bonds. This is in the early 80s when interest rates are at 17%. And we think 5% is bad now, right? But 17%, I, I bought a house at 11% interest once. But... Uh, it was that that got my interest going. And then, uh -huh. so I did municipal bonds. Those are, you know, a million dollars at a time. So you, you don't trade them really fast, but it's it's still a swing trade. You're still trading chart patterns, you know, as they go up and down the swing. Then you exit and buy something different, and then you buy something else again. And so you're buying and selling just at a slower rate. So I went from there to stocks. And I had a really good broker who taught me the ropes. Uh, John Harris was his name. And, and he made lots of money for me and showed me how to do it. And then one day he said, you know, I think you'd be really good at the futures markets. So I started trying to learn from him and the other people in his office and anything I could read and Investor's Business Daily and Wall Street Journal. You know, you just... You just start absorbing everything. And look at the books behind me. Those are only trading books. Wow. Is that is that your personal library there? Or, or, yeah. Uh, no, that's wow. my library. That's amazing. I have a, I have a like 10% of that. What, what's behind you? You probably have, a, there's probably a lot more that you're not yeah, on the screen. You can't see. <laughs> yeah. 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 So awesome. Um. Okay. So you went from bonds to, uh, what, what, did, is there like a sequence uh, that, that you, to stocks mm -hmm. and then futures and then like uh because like when, when did you have your most success because i remember in that chat with traders podcast you were like you were living a lavish lifestyle and traveling all over the world and yeah, <laughs> so uh yeah, so what what was like your best success and that sounded like um what, oh, what, what years was was those it was like it sounded like a boom time or something i started in 1981 when i began trading so we had a boom and then in 87, we had a nice crash. And that was probably my most profitable time. I, I uh, had gone, I'd been looking at charts. I'd been plotting them all by hand on graph paper, you know, the blue and white line stuff, white with blue line. Um, I'd been plotting all my charts on that. And I said to my broker, we're gonna have a crash. And he said, no, we're not. This is the biggest bull run in history. And I said, no, you should look at my charts. I can see it. So I went downtown and had lunch with him and showed him my charts. And he says, those don't mean anything. <laughs> this is before technical analysis was really big. Because, you know, 1987, we, we had 
just recently gotten computers, personal computers. So I said, it's my money. Let's sell everything. And that was in August before the crash in October. So I was on the sidelines. Had I been in the market, I would have lost. Now it would be on paper. Will I take it or not? It's, of course, the question. But I, I would have lost over a million dollars if I stayed in. So then I was I went to Europe and I called him from London and I on Tuesday morning after that crash and said buy everything you can get your hands on. So the combination of those two was probably my biggest trade, <laughs> if you consider it that. Amazing. So a couple of things there. Um, so you knew to when to step out or what so by avoiding a, a massive potential loss this is like a big win in itself yeah you know it's, a, it's something that a lot of people don't understand completely it's like wait a second by being in cash or just not having to, a trade is like a huge a huge win a one <laughs> you had a one million dollar win by not tr by taking your money out cash um, is a position cash is a position Long and short and there's cash and cash is a very good position Yes, exactly. So, and um, you mentioned technical analysis. This is really interesting because, like, a lot of traders now that are are newer to the markets, they don't know. They it. They, they think in, uh, technical analysis has always existed. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> that's true. So so because they don't know they don't know what they don't know. So Steve Neeson, who you've had on your podcast, which we've talked about, this is so interesting. Um, he went to Japan and like discovered the Japanese using candlesticks in their own way for, I think, rice or something like that, rice markets uh -huh. or just markets. Exactly. That's right. And, and then he came to the U.S. and pioneered it over here. And that's where, like, the the technical analysis, what we know today, was born. Is that correct? Well, that's part of it. He brought the candlesticks over much later than technical analysis really began. Uh, one of the beginners of it was a fellow named Wells, Wells Wilder. Have you ever heard of him? Uh, I, I, I don't recall. He's one of the founders and, uh, he created something that we now know as ADX and RSI. You've heard of those, I'm sure. Of, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, he was the creator of those and his book is, I think it's eight and a half by 11 orange, orange hardcover. And it's only about half an inch to three quarters of an inch thick. It's, but it's full of hand calculations showing you exactly how to drive these indicators. Well, I loved it. That came out in 1976. And I loved that book. And of course, sat down right away to program it into my little computer. So he's one of the founders. And then there's, there's, I don't think he's with us anymore, but uh, PQ Wall was one of the early founders. John Bollinger, of course. One of the Bollinger bands came out really early, early 80s. Uh, Tom and Sherman McClellan developed the Sherman, the uh, McClellan oscillator. Actually, Sherman's wife, Marion, just developed. She was the mathematician in the family. So she, he told her what he wanted and she did the math for it. So it was pretty cool. So have you always been uh like good at math like what level of math uh are, are you uh good at because like for example me as an architect people think i'm good at math but actually architects they only need up to calculus and then uh mm -hmm. then that's it and yeah. a little bit and physics one not even physics two yeah <laughs> or anything but you i'm sure oh i went on for years and years and years after that you know eight eight years of more calculus and more out different kinds of algebras and different kinds of geometries and number theory and linear algebra and i mean it's just i took every class that was offered in the math department undergraduate and graduate so so with with okay so this is like something a lot of traders can relate to a lot of times so i, I noticed that a lot of traders uh they have like um analysis paralysis because these are like the people mm -hmm. that are like really analytical or math based and like they're just all about the numbers and they 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 have a really hard time with the creative side, with the artistic yeah. side. So yeah. what, 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 how did you go about that? Cause you're, you're, you like both. both. Yeah. yeah. So it was natural for me. It was, you know, it was just natural, but I, I see patterns. I kind of blur my eyes and look at the chart and I can see patterns in it. 
you know, in the same way, if you're behind the lens of a camera, you see where you want that photograph. You see the composition. It's not just point and shoot. So with charts, I, I do the same kind of thing. And you have to bring in that creative side because Occam's razor is uh, the simpler answer is usually the best answer or something along that line. But, um, you know, you, you, moving averages will work much better than a really highly trained AI at this point because if they're simpler, they work over time. And when you really finally tune something, usually people call it optimizing to find the best parameters. When you do that, then it doesn't work in the future, which is, that's where the money is. It's not in the past. Uh, it's so interesting. So, so going back to that 1987 crash and you didn't, you, you didn't uh, have as, as much information as far as technical analysis back then, or even computers. So like what, what, uh, what like, prompted you was it, uh, to like read it the way you did? Was it like, um, cause you didn't come up with like, for example, we're going to get into it soon about the sunny bands and all that. Like, uh, what, so like, what, 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 what did you see that mm. got you to make that, that, uh, take your money out, you know? Well, there were, it? there were two things. Um, well, more than that, I had learned enough technical analysis to know about trend lines and support and resistance and moving averages. You can calculate your own moving average with a, a simple spreadsheet or, or by hand. So, you know, on a two, 10 period moving average, you just calculate, add up 10 numbers and divide them by 10. Um, I was watching the shape of the market and it made a higher high. And the definition of an uptrend is higher highs and higher lows. Definition of downtrend, lower highs and lower lows. So I had seen a trend go up and make a higher high and come down. Nobody was scared yet. And then it went up again, but it made a lower high. And then it came down below the pivot point of the previous down move. And I said, that's it. We're done. Gotcha. And uh, so that 1987 crash, was that, from what I understand, it was like a, a quick one, right? It was uh, almost like a well, flash in crash. But a, not... For back then, it would have been considered that. Yeah, because it was down on Friday afternoon. It was the what is that the twenty seventh I think of October, uh, it was Black down Friday yeah 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 it was down one hundred and five points. Now, the Dow back then was I don't even remember what it was three hundred, and so one hundred and five is a lot of points. It can't be three hundred because it dropped five hundred and six points on Monday, so that's like six hundred points in two days. And of course, they had to put a halt on the market at the bottom of that because it, 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 no matter what they did, it just kept going down. So, how many times in the market? So, so, when you mentioned the halt on the market, that brings me to twenty twenty that uh, March, uh, March Madness. I think it was March where it, it uh, halted, market halted down, and then mm -hmm. it halted down like several days later, and then I, once more, I believe three times that year. I've never seen that before. So. So you've seen a market halt down before? Oh, several times, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay, so what were the years that it halted? Well, it, the years are not the question. What was I trading? Yeah. Uh, I've seen soybeans go limit down and halt. I've seen corn go limit down and halt. Uh, what else was I trading that did? I think that's that's it, those kind of things. The, oh, silver went down, down, down. Every time they opened it, it went down more. So, you know, they happen. It happens. It doesn't happen as much anymore. See, and this is a. I haven't seen it recently. Well, twenty twenty, but yeah, not very much. And this is with computers, or without computers. There wasn't computers back then. They didn't oh. have. So how computers. how's that like? You know, trading is like a delayed. It's like a delayed reaction, right? It's like yeah. a. You're getting the information and how, how are you basing, you know, tr making trades with the not exact information? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I was trading daily charts, not intraday charts for one thing. So they formed more slowly, generally. 
And I had two brokers on the floor of the exchange. I was trading the E, the S and P at that time. Not we didn't have the E mini yet. So I was trading the big boy, and I would call the floor and say, "Well, I used in the beginning. I called. I said, Hi, this is Sunny Harris. My account number is so and so, and I want to buy twenty S and P's at the market." And the third time I did that, he said, "Don't say all that. Just say it's Sunny. Buy." I'm like, okay. I said, How, why? And he, he said, because you're the only woman that calls the market, calls the floor. So he knew who I was. But uh, so I had these brokers on the floor and they, I would call into them. They would signal the trade into the floor. The pit would signal it back out to that, to the guy on the edge who would signal it to my broker and he would tell me what I got. Now, of course, the fills were a lot of slippage back then too, because by the time those transactions have all taken place you know now it's almost instantaneous now um do you think the market it's easier to make money once you're in the groove like that because for example right now is like it's it's a there's a lot of people involved uh the barrier to entry is none there's basically no commissions very little commissions compared to back then there's mm -hmm. less barriers to entry so that means is but at the same time back then is less competition or is it just harder competition harder. and now so it's harder. So it's harder. It used to be harder. So now it's easier, yeah. you're saying? It's easier now, except for what I call the cowboys. All these new traders that don't know technical analysis and are just trading meme stocks and pushing buttons, you know, getting a feel. And I think it's going to go down. Sell. Uh, that's not what I do. I do a lot of analysis and a lot of mathematics to to, to enter my trades. And I trade five minute charts, so it's pretty fast. Uh, I trade daily charts on stocks and five minute charts on the E-mini. So, so people now, so that, you know, so for example, they don't really teach this stuff in school, right? Would you like, what's your take on that? So like, um, you learned, you, you know, you're a mathematics, you photography, you do it like, but like, they don't really teach trading in school. Like how, can anybody learn because you have all the degrees, you know, you're a PhD, so, like, can someone learn this stuff in school, or do you need like a a mentor that that can show you the ropes? Because, like, for example, for me, um, you know, you, you're you're calling the brokers in the pits. Like, I grew up, I didn't even know what stocks was until I graduated with the with the master's. I didn't even know it existed. I mean, I kind of saw it in the background, but it was a whole world that I knew nothing about. So, like, mm -hmm. how like how did you even get introduced to like calling a broker on the phone and that's on the floor, mm -hmm. having access to that? And like, what's your take like with the whole school? How do you get educated in this uh, these days and and before? I um, I ask a lot of questions. So <clears throat> I started out thinking, how on earth am I going to get in this old boys network and be able to do this? What do you do? So I call up anybody and ask them, how do you do this? What do you do? Give me some. Who else can I talk to? And I made my way through everybody that's anybody in the industry, just picking up the phone and calling them. And I mean, I, I've even sat down uh, with Monroe Trout, which was just an amazing thing. But, um, you know, I, you just call and ask, just start asking. And then I decided um, I was going to write a magazine for people who didn't know how to trade. So I created a little uh, magazine, monthly magazine called... Uh, Traders Catalog and Resource Guide. And it was the how-to, you know, the first half of the, no, the first half of the book was articles. And I would call these same famous people and say, would you write an article for my magazine? And they did. But, you know, this was long before everything was email all over the place. And then the second half of the magazine was yellow pages. And I was collecting names and addresses and services and prices from everybody and i got into the into uh finding the floor brokers that way because because prior to that i'd been using an, an actual stock broker uh incredible that kind of reminds me it's basically what i'm doing with podcasting i create mm -hmm. you create a magazine i create a podcast so anybody you know what i mean and then you 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 uh educate net network with people you make phone calls you reach out so mm -hmm. Wow, incredible. And uh, so and then I wrote uh, a book called Trading 101, How to Trade Like a Pro. 
because I had kept all the notes of how I had figured out what to do. Incredible. So, so how long was that process before you actually started to get profitable? Or was it, or were oh, you already profitable? Well, I, was, I was already profitable. I, I'm one of the lucky few who started out of the gate. And, and it's largely because of my broker that I was telling you about. So, so the broker, like, it showed you the ropes, like, uh, it avoided uh, potential pitfalls, like, by, by, with that knowledge that you, that you were getting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, so how about, uh, you know, so well, I, can't I guess you could say he was my mentor. He was your mentor. He showed me the ropes. Awesome. So, so, okay. So like one thing to take note, like I'm trying to imagine in the eighties and seventies, or I guess the eighties, right. Is that when you started the eighties, the, how was it like? Cause this is, you mentioned the old boys club. I can imagine just like suits. Uh, cause like, I remember there's, it was like the takeover area, like, you know, like the takeover corporate corporate takeover era and like you know i i remember like danny devito in that movie have you seen that you know which one i'm talking about uh yeah uh you like he's a corporate raider <laughs> yeah. danny devito like five foot three guy or something like that no, he's, he's not even that tall he's not even that tall he's like five feet no he's a four I feet i he's... think he's four eleven <laughs> I gave him too much credit, but like, so they, they put him on a suit while well, he had a suit in the movie and he was a corporate raider. He was a, like a, he had a, a guy with a lot of money who would just buy a company up, raid it and sell it for parts Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, then do it over and over. That happened a lot. Yeah. So, so how did you fit into all this as a woman? Like back then it's like, you're not just a random trader, like with a computer, you have to like, you're, you have to make phone calls. They know who you are. You like, you mentioned you're the only woman uh, calling oh, the floor. Yeah. Yeah. So how how did how did you navigate all that? Well, I've never noticed that I was a woman. I've always just been a person, and the other people who are men are just persons to me too. All of my classes in college were with men. All of my my first job was as an engineer uh, program slash programmer for Lockheed. There was only men in that. Uh, so and then when I when I moved down to San Diego and joined this three guys with the little computer program there's three guys and me so i've just never noticed and i'm six feet tall i think that kind of helps ah you're not like danny devito danny, no, danny, <laughs> uh, you got to see that movie it's hilarious um so that's great so it's just it's just uh you you just were concerned with just uh making money and focusing on on the math and and getting the seeing what's on the charts and yeah. So, and people, people looks like, you know, you, you, uh, people didn't, you know, they didn't even look past, you know, they just acknowledge you for that, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Um, when I was performance. 16, yeah. 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 When I was 16, my school counselor said, all right, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, rich and eccentric. And when That's you were 16. Yeah. yeah. So I had the goal and, and I wanted to retire by 40, a millionaire. And I retired by 30. So it's, you know, it's just, I just set bigger and bigger goals. So how, how important do you think it is for people to, when they start on their journey of financial freedom and success to have that vision in, in the future and to, to see it like envision themselves, you know? Uh, yeah. You have to have that, but you also have to have the steps along the way figured out. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to be a Hollywood star and make millions and millions of dollars. And then you don't do the steps to get there. You have to, I, I, my way of thinking, so I have to line them out one by one. I tell people, you want to make a uh, six-figure income trading? Here's how you do it. $120,000 a year divided by 12 months is $10,000 a month divided by 20 trading days is $500 a day divided by five is five one hundred dollar trades that's all you have to make but if you don't know those steps it's kind of a pie in the sky wish yeah yeah you gotta break it down and see it like in small chunks and you're able to, to kind of like understand what you're getting into and what it takes to get so there every single day you figure i'm gonna make a hundred dollars five times and that's all you have to do yeah so okay so um now how did the Sunny Bands come about? Mm. Well, early in my computer trading, now I started using a little program called System Writer 
in 1987. It's a brand new program by a little company called Omega Research. That program now is Trade Station, and the company is Trade Station, and it's a big company, but I have been with them since 1987. So I'm one of the very first Trade Station users. And I love the program and I love their programming language. It's really, it's called Easy Lane, it's really easy to use. And so I was programming and testing systems with Easy Language, uh, I think long before anybody else was. And it was just natural for me because I, you know, when I got my first job, I, country was in a recession. I couldn't find a job as a bachelor's degree mathematician. And so I went, I did photography for nine months. And then I finally said, I've got to have a real job. So I went to a headhunter and she said, can you program? I had had programming classes in college, but I wasn't going to admit to it. I wanted to do pure mathematics. So I said, no. She said, will you say you can program? I'll have you a job tomorrow. I thought, okay, I can program. And that's how that happened. Just one of those fall into it serendipity kinds of things. And the only math class that you really need is symbolic logic. And that's not math. It's just if something's true and something else is false, then false. So you have to do the if-then consequences. And when you divide your six-figure annual salary up, you're doing the steps and the consequences, the ifs and the consequences. So every day you have to just plow through and make that five hundred dollars. Gotcha. So now, um, which so did you code your own uh like algorithms? Of yes, yes. And so I realized that moving averages, which I had coded and put on my program and tested extensively don't in the long run make you money. And the reason, and I tested every moving average available, simple and weighted and exponential and everything. And the problem is they all whipsaw. So during any sideways market time, you're gonna lose money because the moving averages will cross back and forth over each other. So you're gonna lose that money. And I'm thinking there's gotta be a way, I've gotta be able to set up a table or a link table of some kind, or ifs and ands and buts. And, you know, I've got to be able to figure out how to get rid of that whipsaw. And I spent 18 hours a day for 18 months researching and programming. And I came up with my dynamic moving average, which 90% of the time does not whipsaw. And Easy. I quit losing money. Awesome. So, so, um, I so was going to add. Sunny bands uh -huh. came a year later when I realized that if you put average true range bands around this dynamic moving average, you get limits to the, to the price movement. Okay, great. So, so what what year did you kind of like um like feel comfortable with the way it developed? Like you know, you mentioned eighteen hour days for a year and a half. Uh, so when when did you feel uh, like a certain point? It was like okay, uh, I'm. This is uh, pretty good now. 1991. 91. So that took 10 years to get to the point that I was confident in sunny bands and the dynamic moving average. And it's, it's, is it like more like a timeless thing or is you have to keep, you have oh, to yeah. like adapt it here and there? I've never adapted it. I've never optimized it. Uh, I've never changed the parameters. They've been working ever since. Uh, awesome. The trick, is, the trick is, you know how you have in a moving average, you have slow length and fast length or fast length and slow length and they're usually set by default to 9 and 18. so if you don't put those in and you let the average itself calculate its own lengths then you have a dynamic moving average so it's calculating its own lengths dynamically with every tick of the market i see and uh so i was going to ask you too okay so now we have the dot com mania towards the end of uh the 2000 the 90 the 90s yeah. um and then you know recently we had we have all types of manias past couple of years so how did you navigate the dot com mania and uh yeah yeah and well and relate i guess we can relate it back to the recent rain mania does it have any relation like to, to you like the way you traded it both of them 
Well, I mean, when it's going up, you just hold on tight. You know, when that whole dot com thing was going up, you just hang on and wait. But then when it started topping out again, similar to the way the Dow topped out slowly at first and then crashed, uh, I had a hedge fund at the time, in fact, and I lost 11% in that dot com crash. On the which crash. is nothing compared to the fact that the NASDAQ lost, what, 74%? I think 76, 74, something like that. So 11% really was quite good. But the year prior to that, I'd made over 150% for them, and that's what they were expecting. And now I don't have a hedge fund because I don't like uh, trading other people's money. They call you every single day and want to know, how'd you do today? What did you trade? Give me, give me your list of trades. And you, you just can't do that and keep up with running the hedge fund and trading. You know, you don't want anybody influencing your trading decisions. Yeah. So how, how long did you have the fund for? Two years. Two years. And, it, you know, you uh, that was during the dot-com mania? Mm-hmm. Wow. Before, before it and after it. Before, before and after it. So the stories that I've had some people on the podcast uh, that had one, I had one um, former submarine commander that ran a hedge fund during the, uh, dot com mania a nuclear yeah. submarine yeah and um i've heard a lot of stories about uh that dot com crash and like people losing a so how, how did you so see your peers during that time did a lot of them like wiped they didn't they, they wiped out so like how did you did, know to get out at 11 percent down that's that's extremely good because like most people didn't there's very few people that that like you know kept their their gains from the from prior well, I'd been trading short. It's just that the problem with the shorts is they would get a, a the surprises they say in a in a downtrend or to the upside. So you you're in a good short trade, and all of a sudden it goes screaming up on one bar. You you can't catch up with it, can't chase that, and then it'll turn around and come right back down again. So it was that mm, volatility, I guess, that made me say, I can't I can't even trade this. This is crazy. So That's I just stepped aside for a little while. Awesome. And um, so so are you were you using math to guide you mostly that during that time, or were you uh because because remember this is I'm I'm trying to understand, put myself in the time and place using my imagination here. Um creativity, right? So you put yourself in the time and place, and like people are buying anything with dot com in it. Everyone's, you know, you have Mark Cuban with broadcast.com, he sell, he sells to Yahoo gets a ton of shares, sells at the dead top, even shorts, I believe, um, with put options or something like that. Mm. And, and, and you have like, but but you're just math based or were you thinking like, this is all a bubble? I've, <clears throat> this is the tulip mania, yeah, laundry.com. What's that? I was, reading, I was reading about tulips at the time. And, I'm, and there's a book I cannot remember for the life of me what the name of this book is i i saw it the other day and i'm thinking i've got to remember that book to tell it to some of my students you know it's uh it's it's the way to tell where you are in the market cycle by the by percentages of what's happening in the markets and he he analyzes four different markets uh interest rates gold uh stock market and cash i think and he let he gives you the formula so that you can figure out which phase we're in and invest in the proper thing at the proper time. Gotcha. And um, and how about computers? Because now we're getting into the computer era. So the computers assist your trading a lot. Like now you're just uh, you blossomed because now you have a, a tool that can help you do your math even yeah. well, better. Well, it, it's not so much the math; it's technical analysis that I'm using, and and logic, you know. I, I'm painfully logical, so um, it's not. It really isn't a lot of math. I can teach you is all the math you need to know in an hour, you know. But um, I just watch charts, and of course, by then I had sunny bands on everything, so I'm just watching the signals on the sunny bands. Do you have Trade Station? I I had Trade Station uh, for a long time uh, during. 2021 to 2023 is when I act really actively used it. I mm -hmm. never utilized the uh, the algos on it, but mm -hmm. I had friends that did. Um, 
but then they change their commission structure for the stocks that I trade, which is like uh the, the lower price ones a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I, I paused for now and I'm open in the future because like it's it's uh if you're doing algo trading, I think it's it's uh I've I've heard a lot of good things about it. Mm -hmm. Um or you know, yeah, that kind of stuff, like programming. Yeah. Um so Absolutely. how do, how do you use so trade station? I'm asking because my sunny bands are on TradeStation. I'd be happy. Oh, they are. Okay. I'd be ha if you had TradeStation, I could give you a free uh, license for a while so you could see what it does and use it. And I'll, uh, I'll check it I out. Always, yeah. I always do Zoom calls with people so that I, I do a white glove installation for them, show them how I use it, leave them alone for a couple of days. And then we do another uh, Zoom call in the live markets. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm real hands on with my products. Uh huh. Wow. So it's it's available on Tracy. Do Do you know if you're gonna have it on uh write a book on it or something anytime soon? Because I know there's mm -hmm. like a, a book, for example, that I read on Anchor VWAP. You know they mm -hmm. have that on certain platforms as well. I think uh, TC two thousand mm -hmm. and stuff. So like, um. Yeah, you should, are you planning on on re getting all the info? Like, how can someone get a lot of information on Sunny Bands? MoneyMentor.com. Okay. My phone number's at the top. My email's at the top. You can get a hold of me. No problem. I'd love to take phone calls. And all you have to do is click on Products and Services and pull down to Sunny Bands. Awesome, awesome. So to start to wrap it up, uh, Sunny, so any, any other... What what what's your what advice would you give to newer traders starting out that are interested in technicals and getting into you know that side of the world of trading? Learn everything you can possibly learn. Just read and read and read, and then test the ideas. If you don't have TradeStation to test them with, then you can test them on paper. There's nothing wrong with a piece of lined paper and a whole bunch of calculations, or better yet, a spreadsheet. So if you use Excel, you can put your stuff in there and you run calculations much faster than you can run by hand. So when you get an idea or read about an idea or come up with something you think works, test it. And then my best advice is trade it in simulation mode until you're profitable. I have one client that called me up and he said, I'm going to start trading live now. I've only lost $900. That's a, not a very good hourly wage. I want you to wait until you're profitable. And that would be what I would tell people. Awesome. Wait, wait, there's always another trade. Absolutely, absolutely. You don't have to be uh, over trading and forcing a trade and trying to pull, trying to force money out of the market. This is not the way. So, like trading the sim, that's that's great practice. It's not you know you can just keep practicing, keep reading. I love that you have all the books. I, I've ran into some traders. They're like, I don't need to read, you know, uh, like I, they just they just want to trade. They don't want to mm -hmm. like like, you know, the books are a great resource. It's like all, all takeaways from people that spent a lifetime doing something. You get all those takeaways in, in one in one condensed format. So absolutely true. And the other thing is I do offer if you if you either text me to my cell phone, which is at the top of moneymentor.com, if you text me, uh what is it, Diane? Text me trial. Well, text me trial, I'll send you a free trial of Sunny Bands. But if you text me uh um, guest, guest pass, thank you. If you text me guest pass. I'll uh, let you into a Wednesday live trading room. I do an everyday live trading room for an hour, nine o'clock to 10 o'clock Pacific time. And people can watch exactly how I'm using Sunny Bands. I talk them through it. I tell them what I'm going to trade and why. And uh, it's an hour of fun. And if you want to join in for free, send me a text guest pass. Awesome. Well, yep. Sonny, uh, great. We have all that information now. Every, the listeners can can go check it out, and I'll have some of it on the show notes for you for anyone that wants to check it out. And thank you so much, Sonny, for coming on the podcast and giving us a whole world of knowledge. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. And, uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch. All right. Thank you, David. Thanks, Sonny. I'll see have you later. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. You too.